Mountain goats. <laughs> yes. It feels good to say it, right? Yeah, That's why it's, fun. it's the band name kind yeah, of. It just of feels course. good to say it. The Mountain Goats. <laughs> yeah. Funny. It's so completely incongruous. Yes. <laughs> no it's from official. a Jay Hawkins song. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, welcome, uh, John. You and Matt sound great. Thank you, especially yeah. Matt. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but such good, um, good range, wide range of uh, subject matter. That you. Uh, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, wizards, dragons. I'm like really exhilarated because, like, I think you probably know this. Like, um, I wrote that song a, a good while back, and I, I remember the whole process of writing it. And then it's only been played live for one audience ever, and it was a college audience in Alabama who I asked kindly not to tape it, and they didn't. Right? I was extremely happy. So, like, that's the first time anybody's heard it besides us, which Wild. is exciting. So. Wild. That's great. That's great. Um, I can't help but think, just because you know, partly it's your youth, youthful enthusiasm. Um, I can't <laughs> can't help but think about your your early days. Um, and and did you, did you lived in Claremont, California? Was that where you sort of started getting into guitar playing? Or well, I'm, always like, I'm conscious when I'm on the radio is like I talk a lot when I get going. Um, so here's the here's the development of me and the guitar. Right uh, when I was um, I want to say twelve or thirteen, I had a bully. Um, who would follow me home, and he, he lived on my block, right? And I was scrawny, I couldn't defend myself. Um, so I started walking downtown, and he followed me the first time, but I started going to stores where they knew me, record stores, and I was 12, haunting the record store, haunting the Folk Music Center, which was run by uh, Charlie and Dorothy Chase, Ben Harper's Oh, Ben parents. Harper's folks, yeah. Yeah. Well, I went to school with Ben, we were grade school uh, people together, and so I would go to the Folk Music Center, and I knew that the bullies, like, the musical environment was just not, I think they could feel it was a kind of magic that was yeah, not available these are to not them, their right? People. Yeah. And so I, I would go in, right? Well, but then you're sort of dedicated. Two things happened as a result of this. One, one day I went to the library and like they stopped at the outside and I went in and said, I would like to volunteer. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I cleaned microfiche for about a year and records. Um, Wild. And, uh, and shelved some books. And then the other place was the Folk Music Center. I would go in there and they had walls full of guitars and, um, and I would pick up a guitar, I didn't know how to play, I played some piano, I had formal training, and I would go over to the chord charts and look at a chord, and then, and this is very, this tells you more about me than is comfortable, but I would look at the chord, look real hard at it, because I didn't know anything about a fretboard, then I would put the book back where it goes, because I'm Catholic, right? <laughs> then I would go over to the guitar and see if I could remember. Yeah. Now, you might say, why didn't you take the chord chart over to where the guitars are. Right. And I would say, well, I can't explain that to you. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I would do. And I learned. And you it. didn't buy the book either, so you were well, cheap I didn't as have well. Any money. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I could do about that. So I, had, I knew D and G for the longest time. Wow. That was about it. And yeah. then once you I got a go real job. You can go a long way with G and D. You can. Yeah. You only need three, really. Yeah. And if you get a relative minor, then yeah. you could, right? But, um, but, but so then years later, uh, when I was 22, 23, I had my first job that paid anything. And there was a strip mall store, and this sounds like one of those stories that Tom Waits would tell, and you'd go, ah, Tom, you're kind of polishing the legend a little bit there. But it was run by a couple of blind old men who were, who were identical twin brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true, right? Yeah. It was in Norwalk, California, yeah. and you would go in there, and they would, it was like, it was like the, uh, uh, who's, who is it in the Blues Brothers, the singer who... Uh, uh, Thank you, it's Ray Charles, right? And who you know, knows when you're coming in to the store. And it was that, they'd come in and say, what can we do for you? And I'd go, uh, look at the guitars? Because I was making money and living in employee housing, right? And employee housing cost almost nothing. And, right. it, and it was worth it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I bought a $79 Korean import guitar. Uh, Could they tell when you were coming in the store? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. They would, yeah. They would turn Here and comes go, John. Here's, here's oh, some. not me. They didn't know me that well. No. But, but I bought that, and I bought a Hawaiian slack key guitar oh, yeah. that I still have. The, I mean, it looks. Yeah. I, I wonder what its provenance actually is because it's real cool. But, but I taught I, myself on those. I learned something about you too that I think is is worth noting. That even though you started in these folk, this very earnest sort of folk music world, and you're there, you know, looking at the chords and figuring out how to play G, C, and D. You also were really influenced by the movie Animal House. So just as I, I want to run with this, but I know, but I'm oh, just. Oh, I know where you're going with this. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so you know, you're thinking about the earnestness that comes from folk music, right? And the idea that you could play some traditional music, and you could probably, especially if you're someone who's been bullied, and you're scrawny, and you're right. a teenager, and you know some chords and can sing. Suddenly, you're cool at the campfire, and girls would pay attention to you. Right, but no, that's not that's not my end of it at all. Right. 
because I, you've heard this story. So I grew up in Southern California in the 70s. And the dude with the acoustic guitar at the party is the dude who is trying to use the acoustic guitar to get you into bed, right? And I found that really noxious and gross, right? And there's a scene in Animal House where a guy is playing, I gave my love a cherry, this old, and it, 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 he's a layover over the folk music, of, folk movement of the yeah. 60s, which attracted like any successful movement. I remember people going, how can I get in on this? Either make right. money or get people into bed, right? And he's playing, I gave my love a cherry, and Bluto, John Belushi says, can I see that for a minute? And he hands him the guitar, and Bluto smashes it very violently and hands him back the neck. <laughs> he goes, eh. and, and I was like, that was my opinion, because I grew up in, the, in California in the 70s. The guy who brings the acoustic guitar to the party is not the guy you want to be. So I was very against that yeah. sort of thing. And all folk music sort of had a tinge on it. it took me, fortunately for me, I am a person who, if I have any violent reaction to something, at some point I, I want to go investigate that. And when I was living in employee housing, when I was 22, I saw a Joni Mitchell tape. It was blue, and I went, well, you should look into this yeah. folk songwriter. And Came Blue, of circle. course, is probably the greatest album ever yeah. made in popular music. Um, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just the greatest. Nothing yeah. can compare. And, uh, and it changed my life. I was like, oh, and it's got David Crosby. You like to hate on him, too, but listen to those harmonies. That are insane. I mean, David Crosby's gifts as a vocal harmonist yeah, are, amazing. are non, yeah. and, and so it changed the way I listen to music a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's still, like, it's still a lot of that stuff. The folk, the, the, the folk movie of the 70s. Stylistically and vibe-wise, you, you know. didn't learn. I gave my love a cherry. No, no and I, I and I think when you refer to your uh, your if your partner's a woman and you call her your old lady, I don't know if I'm down with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like some yeah. of that stuff is a bad taste. I mean, you do you, but but uh, <laughs> but but yeah. I mean, I grew up in that environment. I was like conditioned to dislike the 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 protest singer, but actually, a lot of that stuff is great. So. Yeah, and and in some ways, you're you're becoming that in so, in a more oblique way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do want to, I mean, we've, we could talk for a while, and then we have a lot of music to get to, too. A couple things. It's funny looking at your body of work and looking at your life from a distance, because we're just meeting today. Um, I think of you as being one of those writers who's sort of done everything and can write from, or like Hemingway or somebody who can write oh, about you. stuff because he's done all this wacky stuff. And there are very few people I can think of who can write from experience about um, the things you've you've experienced, yeah. you know, and that just, you know, being a dad, being an IV drug user formerly, being yeah. a Christian, being a punk rocker, being a rebellious teenager. I mean, yeah. all the things you write about, um, you, you know, you know that stuff. Well, I think, that, so I have a theory, um, as people tend to have, uh, and, and I think whenever you write something, you're telling me something about yourself, right? And I came to this theory around the outside by saying I'm not going to write confessional stuff because all the singer-songwriters of the 70s were confessional and so forth. And then I began to notice, if you look at the song hard enough, it was like Franklin Bruno, actually, who plays keyboards and guitar on, on several of the uh, albums from the 2000s on 4ED, um, gave me some readings of some songs he was playing on, where I said, you know, I don't really know what the song is about. He said, it's about touring. And I said, what are you even talking about? I don't write songs about touring. That's what the James Gang does. I'm not doing that. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, no, it's, and, and he explained how it played with another song on the album that one was about touring and one was about recording albums. I was like, no, I don't write songs about that. And I listened, and I looked at it and I was like, oh, you're right. <laughs> it's like, Wild. you know, so I do think no matter what you do, it's like in a dream, mm -hmm. there's only one character in a dream and that's you, yeah. right? They wear different faces, but it's mm -hmm. all you. And I think in your, in your work, you are self-expressing whether you want to or not. Are there songs from your earlier catalog that you're not comfortable playing anymore? Or? Yeah, I mean, I don't play Going to Georgia anymore, which people really like that song, and it's got a good riff and everything, but it is a song in which a guy shows up at his ex's house with a gun in his hand. And the thing is, like, then she takes it away from him and there's a tenderness to it, but... It, you know, with yeah. respect to anybody who's a normal person who likes this song, it, it was attracting the wrong element. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know, and I had done it for like 15 years at that point, so it was perfectly fine to retire it, you know. But the thing is, a lot of young boy songwriters, and I was one of them, find the figure of the sort of the guy who is so overwhelmed by his feelings that he does something foolish, right? and demands that his beloved sort of recognize the extremity of that emotion, mm -hmm. that struck me as romantic once and it doesn't anymore, yeah. right? And so I don't want to, well, thank I mean, but I don't deserve any applause for that. It's like, it's just thank it's you. It's called but, maturity, maybe, or it, yes. Yeah, but the thing is, like, I also want to say, if there's a young songwriter who has tons of charisma and is laying down good jams with that, I don't want to hate on that as a theme. It's fine, you can play with that. I don't, yeah. I don't believe in disappearing a theme forever like that because... You go through phases, you grow, yeah. you can't, if you come out of the womb politically enlightened, 
then you are a freak of nature and, <laughs> and should be in a lab and be investigated, right? It's like, actually, you have to be wrong a lot before you can come to write, or your rightness is meaningless, you know? And so yeah. that's my feeling about that. What about um, songs like sing-alongs, like, like No Children, where everybody knows all the words? But it was never a sing-along. For, we didn't even play it live for like the first three or four tours after it was released. We never played it live because I didn't think I could. Yeah. Um, because it's a hard song to play, and, uh, and I forget which fret the capo goes on, and, and I forget how to pronounce capo. You've got to go back to the chord chart. No, it became, that's the thing is, that one is so satisfying because we didn't, I put it on side two, I didn't figure most people would be that into it, right. you know, and it really, it found its own yeah. people. It yeah. sort of went out like a jellyfish and, right. and said, you know, I will find the ones that belong to me and absorb them into right. myself. It's, <laughs> Um, and, pe and people made you uncomfortable, and they said, oh, man, that's our song. It's well, it like, yeah. doesn't make me uncomfortable. It's like, I worry about them. Yeah, I, it's like, I, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I put on my, you know, I used to be a psych nurse, and I go, you know, well, that, tell me more about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, come, come see me in two years, and they do, and they say, right. oh, I told you two years ago that was our song. I said, how, how she, well, she, I don't know where she's at. But yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I think this is your 17th record, Mountain Goats record? I always say it's my second, but Your yeah. second, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so are you a guy who writes songs quickly? Are you a fast songwriter, or does this take a while? Not as. I try to take more time now just because I'm growing as a songwriter. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not as, you know, my old stuff, what I was most interested in was, was preserving the immediacy of that moment in which you yeah. get, you can feel, okay, this is going to be a song. On the boombox. And I wanted it to be out there before it actually fully congealed around the song. It's like I wanted it to, you yeah. to hear the moment of the birth, and that was yeah. important to me at that time. But I sort of went really as far as I found compelling for me with that. And then I thought, well, then if you go even one song further than when you're actually interested in it, then you are a poser, right? And... Uh, and, it, and it's ugly to see somebody going, well, I'm going to crank up this thing for you that's not actually me anymore, but I know it's what you want. You know, you don't want to do that. So, right. And I also became a better musician. I started playing with better musicians like Matt and like John Worcester and Peter Hughes and Franklin Bruno and Bob Bailey. And, uh, and my own playing, although still easily the worst player in my band, um, I'm getting better, right? I, mean, I, I gained a, like an incredible deep respect for, for bluegrass and for reggae, which I consider the, the fields that have the highest... Uh, barrier for entry of musicianship, like your average bluegrass musician has smoked me seven days out of seven on anything, right? And uh, and your average reggae we drummer... We talked about our history before, right? Yeah, well, he's in a band called Hot Rise, which is one of the first records I bought off iTunes when iTunes was new. Uh, I mean, but you know what I'm talking about. It's like, at a bluegrass, at a bluegrass festival, the absolute worst act is considerably better than probably the third best act at Coachella as a player, <laughs> right? It's like, and that's... And that's just a fact. I mean, it's like it's not, it's not even an insult to anybody. It's like in jazz. You get your average entry-level jazz pianist, and he is absolutely going to walk all over your rock and roll pianist, who has his own thing, and that's right. fine, too. It's yeah. not hating. Yeah. But I'm so much more interested in, in playing music as an ensemble now and yeah. in listening to each other and in just making room for the incredible quality of the yeah. musicians that I'm privileged enough to work with. I mean, well, you've also created a community, and I think it's important that you, the body of your work, the, the, the you know, you put in your time. You've, you've spent a lot of time doing this. Yeah, no, and I, you I like an to audience, work, and you like to work, and people, people appreciate what you do. And so it's really, um, especially these days when there's, um, you know, people are less churched than they used to be, for example, it's really important yeah. for people to come together, especially sing together and hang out around music. It's, it's, a, it's, a, real, it's a real important part of how we are and how we are in society. So yeah, you even know, if the so songs are weird and twisted, it's, it's important. Well, it's, it's funny. I, mean, I have a lot to say about you were talking about church, and like uh, when they called while I was, uh, we were finally getting out of the airport. I was, we were in transit about 20 hours getting here, and um, and to ask what song we might do at the end together. And I, and one of them I named was uh, This Little Light, another was Jesus Loves Me. I think of hymns because I listen to a lot of gospel, uh, older gospel, and, and 80s gospel too, Mighty Clouds of Joy, Shirley Caesar. But, you know, a lot of the rock and roll that we like came out of the gospel tradition. Yeah. Sam Cooke and the Soulsters, right? I mean, all those. Aretha, yeah. All those guys. Yeah. And, and Elvis, Aretha, Ray Charles, everybody mm -hmm. came out of the gospel tradition where you would be singing every single Sunday. And if you sang badly, it, it, it wasn't the audience you were worried about. It was the almighty Lord who made you, right? And so, and your parents probably. And so, um, 
And, and I think about that a lot, about how, you know, we did lose that, for better and worse, you know, in the, the influence of the church and society goes uh, several ways, but, but to gather together and sing yeah. and experience music together is incredibly potent. And I'll tell you a story that I'll try and keep as short as I can, because I know I yammer on a lot, but, but my son, um, my older son, Roman, uh, is, a, is a very emotional dude sometimes, but you don't notice it, because he's also a very boisterous dude, right? And... Uh, and he had song time every night for the first four or five years of his life. I played 1952 Gibson, uh, you know, the ones that were marketed in Sears that we play. And has a whole bunch of songs we play together. And we're in the ocean on vacation in the Outer Banks. I'm holding him. And I just started singing um, uh, a song called On Eagle's Wings. From, uh, it's from the Catholic, the newer Catholic liturgy. So it's a 70s folk song. Do you know this one? No. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Right. Well, my son doesn't know what any of these words are about, right? But he just started to wail. Right, like really, like inconsolable crying, wow. and like I was like, "Oh, buddy, no, it's cool, it's cool." And it was like an hour fit. It was like it was a totally like, and then I had to check, you know. So like the next day, I was hum a little bit, and like boom, the trigger goes off. Right, wow. something about those church tunes just reaches people at their gut, whether they have any idea what you're trying to sing about or not. Yeah. It's like it's so. I'm very into it. Yeah, you know, you know and and um, the addendum to your story is just that we also are into it. And uh, this is an old church. Yeah. And um, so once a month now, we do a service here called Hippie Bluegrass Church. No kidding. And it's a live bluegrass band, and we project all the lyrics on the screen, and it's free, and everybody comes, and they all sing all the songs. God, I would love to come if I was good Hippie enough to sing with the bluegrass. Hippie Bluegrass Church, come on, man, you could do it. <laughs> but uh, no, I would love, I, some, one of these days I'll get out here, I actually want to bring, um, there's, a, there's two places that sell um, cool, shiny rocks, you know, like mineral, minerals on the mall down there. There's also the kite store, so I'll bring my family in here. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I'm a, used, I'm a fan. It used to be the weed shop, and now it's the kite shop. It's just it's, it's the, it's the way it works. Kites are taking, they're what's next. They're yeah. <laughs> recreational and medical kites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to music. Very glad you're here. Thanks for coming, John. Appreciate it. Thank well, you so much for having me. It's really an honor. Welcome back. The Mountain Goats. Hi, this is Nick Forster from E-Town. If you want to stay up to date with all the performances, interviews, and behind-the-scenes footage, click the subscribe button. Thanks. <laughs>